Uh, Tuesday night, I have to ascribe uh, my start to the sermon tonight, or to this, this morning. Uh, Tuesday night, a group of young adults gathered, uh, and we talked about uh, an idea of self, right? We talked about that. And uh, I made the point, and I think uh, they agreed with me, that we live in a culture obsessed with the self. Uh, in fact, if you go to a local bookstore, I bet there's this whole section filled with books about um, improving oneself, right? Self-improvement or self-actualization or um, some ways to, to make ourselves better, to uh, fix ourselves, to, to maybe go out and find ourselves. We are preoccupied with the self. We are obsessed with the self. Uh, Rollo May, who's a psych psychologist, Christian psychologist, will often say that when someone comes into his office and oftentimes the first thing they say to, to him is, I need help. I need, I need you to help me fix myself. Right? And May often will ask, well, what is this self you're trying to fix. And there's a reason, I think, part of our culture, we are just obsessed and focused on the self. In many ways, it's very much a part of uh, our society and culture of Western philosophy. Uh, now, I'm going to share a little bit this morning about one of my favorite philosophers, and I've, I've mentioned to him before, so some of you may recognize his name, Emmanuel Levinas. And uh, who's heard of Emmanuel Levinas? Well, good. Maybe, maybe this is new to most of you. So, Emmanuel Levinas was a French philosopher, a Jewish rabbi, who lived in the mid 20th century. And Levinas was making his name. He studied under two German philosophers. And I promise I'm not going to get too much in the weeds of philosophy and put you to sleep. But. Um, he, uh, he studied under two German philosophers named Heidegger and Husserl, who had founded a school of phenomenology. And basically, um, the school of phenomenology essentially, I mean, Western philosophy has always been worried about the self. How do we know the self is real? And so it, it uses ontology, the study of being. And in Heidegger and Husserl's opinion, the way we know we are, exist as selves is because we have a consciousness of phenomena. So uh, the way we know we're real is because we have these selves. And Levinas had embraced this particular school of philosophy, in fact became well known for translating it uh, to the French society at the time. And Levinas lived in the late 20s and early part of the 30s until Levinas began to be quite discouraged and depressed that Heidegger and Husserl were embracing in Germany in the 30s what? Nazism. The national, nationalism. And began to use their philosophy of self to uh, pursue that. And Levinas, being a, uh, a Jew um, and a philosopher, found this very disturbing. And so... Uh, Germany invades France, Levinas returns to France, and uh, what Levinas does is he joins the French army and fights, um, they get defeated, he's captured, he's put in a POW camp uh, as an officer, his wife and daughter are put into a concentration camp, they did survive, but they were put into a concentration camp, and Levinas has this crisis about philosophy in Western philosophy in specific. And he begins to wrestle with essential questions about what is life about, even in the POW camp. And based on his Jewish understanding, his reading of the Hebrew Scriptures, this idea of God's otherness, uh, and part of the Jewish idea is that um, one cannot fully know God because God is totally other. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, you can't even name God because God is other. And Levinas began to apply this idea 
to human beings. And his argument is, and what he lifts up, is this idea that the self is really not what's real. It's the other that is real. Whether that is God or the other in individuals. And he comes up with two really subtle but radical ideas. The first is, we cannot fully know the other. That to claim you know another is to, in a way, subsume them in your own self. So what he's arguing is that it's important in human beings to honor the otherness of the other person. To fully realize you cannot know them fully. So, uh, for instance, I've been married to the same woman, women, woman for 26 years. Woman for 26 years. And for me to say, I probably know her better than anybody else. Uh, maybe other than my kids. But Levinas would say it would be, a, it would be a, a broken thing, a sinful thing, to say even that woman I've known for 26 years, that I fully know her, that I don't honor her others. It's kind of a, a wild idea is we think we know other people, right? I see someone's post on Facebook. Well, I know who they are. I hear their, uh, their political affiliation. Oh, I know who they are. We do it all the time in that we don't honor the otherness of people, that we can't really fully grasp who they are in all their complexity, all their otherness. God is present in them and other. Everybody, not just some people, everybody is a stranger to us. And when we don't embrace that truth, our self becomes the whole world. And the second insight Levinas has is he says, you know what? We owe everything to the other, to the stranger. That Western philosophy, which is kind of this belly button, navel gazing kind of reflection on the self, that's not what philosophy should be about. What philosophy should be about, and he pointed to, is how we serve the other. And Levinas has this almost impossible ethic in which he says we owe everything to the other. We should serve the other no matter who they are. Even, Levinas says, the guard and his POW. So not only are people other and stranger, no matter who they are, we're supposed to welcome that stranger no matter who they are. I don't know about you, but I find that idea rather unsettling and uncomfortable. And then I read the passage we had this morning. And it seems like it's, it's straightforward enough. Abraham sitting at the entrance of his tent and he sees these three stranger, these strangers who appear out of nowhere. And what's interesting, it isn't just that he kind of said as they were walking by, kind of wooing them in. The text says he sees these strangers, these others, and he runs to them. Now this isn't, uh, I'm sorry, church hospitality. It isn't just simply sitting here and we welcome these strange people who come, these visitors, and say, well... It, the idea here being expressed is running out to meet the strangers, to welcome them. Even in the story of Lot, he's standing at the gates of Sodom 
And he must be looking for strangers. He's got to be actively looking for the other so that he can run and welcome. He reaches out. He, he, he demands that he be able to serve them. And that's what they do. It's amazing. A description of what all they do to welcome the stranger, right? Cook all this food. They sit him at the table. Abraham doesn't even sit at the table with him. He stands to the side. He's serving the other, serving the stranger. And it's a, a kind of unsettling idea. Because God knows in our world today, in our country, we put strangers in cages, right? We're frightened of any stranger or other. much less running to meet them and welcome them and serve them. I would argue that the essence of justice for Jesus is this capacity and willingness to embrace and welcome the stranger. You cannot read the Gospel without Him welcoming strangers, a Syrophoenician woman, the Samaritan, that what defines discipleship and what defines justice for him is this capacity to love the other and serve them. No matter what. So the challenge for us is who are we running to serve? The challenge for us this week is what are the ways in which we truly welcome the stranger around us? What are the ways? Are we willing to reach out of our, our, ourselves and embrace the otherness around us? Both the neighbor we know and the refugee at our border. That the very definition of compassion and justice is that willingness to welcome the stranger. To God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen.